I was on the phone uh, with somebody doing a marketing consult and found out that they're paying a company out of state for uh, about $5,200 a month and they don't know whether that's translating into business for them. You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Downloadable audio episodes can be found in the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie, and today we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Tara Ingalls of Tingles Design for the third time. Mm -hmm. That's how awesome of a guest you are. Three Pete. Three Pete. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being on here. So tell me a story. You let's just start with the the beginning. Way the beginning. back when. You always have me start at the beginning. I know. Well, I just for the people that weren't lucky enough to watch the first two. So let's I just, shouldn't look at the camera. I should look at you. No, I just look. We're just chilling. Okay, we're, we're just, chilling. just chilling. Okay. So, so what year did you start your business? So I started in two thousand. So right. we'll be 2000? celebrating. Two thousand. Yeah. So we'll be starting. Um, we'll be celebrating our twenty fifth year in January. Super Holy excited cow. about that. That yeah. is awesome. Ha quarter century started when I was eight. I just raced so. through my head like 2000. Okay, we're talking internets five, six years old. <laughs> yeah, right. Social media is yeah. not Hand even a phrase. Hand coding websites with HTML. Oh really, my gosh. Really learned it from a book. It was yeah. great. It was great. No yeah. Dreamweaver. No, I mean, nope. Photoshop, you're splitting stuff up, right? A little bit. Yeah, Photoshop and Illustrator are out for sure. InDesign was just coming on the market to com compete against Quark Express, which I was extremely proficient Quark in. Quark Express! Quark oh my Ex gosh. Quark Express, yeah. Wow. So all my designers that I hired were all InDesigners, and so you know, I held out as long as I could, um, but now I don't do any of the layout, so all right. I don't have to worry about it. Oh. Hands off. I'm done. All right. Yeah, so but that, uh, yeah, so 2000, um, I got married and my name changed from my T. Hallam, which was my email prefix where I worked, and it changed to Tingles. People thought that was very clever and fun. <laughs> nice. So I started freelancing on the side, and then in 2001, actually shortly after September 11th, I quit my job and started freelancing full time. Wow. So, yeah, and just been growing exponentially since then, primarily working with small businesses, startups. Um, Nonprofits. I love working with nonprofits, um, and then we also work with larger companies that don't have graphic designers on staff that have a marketing department but don't have like that graphic design skill set. We can come in and we can help um, them out. So all right, yeah. So in 25 years. Yeah. The landscape of graphic design has probably changed a lot. It has a lot. It's I so mean, just the programs. Yeah. The so much more digital than we used to do. About 25% web, and then you know 75% print work and trade shows and sales collateral and all that kind of stuff. Now I would say it's probably completely flipped on its head. We're doing. I mean, my firm is doing probably about 75-25. So 75% website work, digital, digital social media creation, digital marketing ads that pay-per-click, that kind of stuff. And okay. Then, but our bread and butter at Tingles has always been logo design, sales collateral, like high-end branding, like the look and feel of a brand. How does a brand want to feel? Um, what is their messaging strategy? Who's their target audience? Um, those kinds of things is what I specialize and focus on as the owner. All right. And then the designers really take all of that and, you know, spice it up with some amazing design work. And Nice. Yeah. Tell um, me a story about the social media end. Because 2000, social media is not a thing. Yeah. Now, so, sh social media is definitely a thing. Yeah. You get 50 million platforms. Yeah. You get different audiences on each one. You have different uh, ways. I don't even know all the all the yeah. variables. I, even, I can hardly keep up. I had somebody ask me, "What's my Instagram handle?" And I'm like, "Dude, I'm over 40. I don't <laughs> have an Instagram handle." <laughs> handle. It seems like such an old school. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Snap Talk. I'm not on those. Uh, um, I, you know, it. So my advice when it comes to social media is to do the legwork to understand which one of the platforms your target market is on, and then do that one really well. Okay. And then you know maybe have two other ones that you also have a presence on that might be the second and third. Um, but if you pick one and you do one really well, you know that's going to be your best bang for your time and you know for your dollars. The the problem with social media is that people think that it's a sales tool and it really is not meant to be that. It's meant to be, you know, a way for uh, to me it's like a it's like a customer service drop box in a lot of ways where okay. people can 
you know, they have the ability to send you to write reviews, both positive and negative. They have the ability to comment on anything you post, positive and negative. And it, so it can be, you know, somewhat of a, you know, unless you're not, unless you're managing on a regular basis, people will start to feel like as a business owner, you're not engaged, you're not really using the platform unless you're commenting back and things like that. So a lot of people will say, oh, I'm on Facebook, but I'm, I don't get any business from it. Well, that's not the point. The point is to use Facebook specifically to manage your relationships with your customers and your potential uh, prospects and not necessarily like 20, 25% off, you know, if you sign on now, things like that. So, oh. I mean, the scope of, of Facebook has changed considerably. Um, even I'm having trouble getting my my following to engage, comment, and like, and share on our posts and things without having to pay for it. And so I feel like that's completely shifting now and the algorithms for people engaging with content, you know, watching your eyeballs and how you do all that kind of stuff has really got people pretty spooked and stuff when it comes to Facebook. So. Um, Spooked. But also, just like you know, people like uh, my husband and I were in the market for a bed, and we were talking about it in the car. I opened up Facebook, and I literally had a Tempur Pedic ad for three hundred bucks from Slumberland. Oh, creepy! Yeah, very creepy. As I had just said, I know someone who is the general manager at Slumberland. So, like, it heard the word Slumberland, it heard the word bed, you know, and it served me an ad, and it was like. You know, and some people are like, wow, that's perfect. You know, clicked on the ad and now they've got $300 off the Tempur-Pedic, yeah, you know. Yeah, people more on. This is yeah. creepy. <laughs> but for me, I was just like, I was annoyed and I actually deleted Facebook on the spot. And this was like a Friday. And by Monday, I was back on it because oh. I was just like, you know, I need it for business. No. I, uh, I needed it for business. And, you know, I, I don't know, like I still connect with a lot of family on Facebook and things like that. So I tell people it's for my business, but you know, it's, I also use it socially. So, um, but you know, I'm the target demographic for Facebook. You know, sure. I started using it when my 18 year old was an infant and you know, so I'm that demographic. But so yeah, I, I don't know. Social media has just blown up with so many different platforms and so many different options and ways that you can, you know, that are, some are entertainment, some are business based, you know, it's just the consumption of content. Um, I have three teens and it's just, it's crazy how much content they consume um, you know, in it, you know, and what it does to their behavior, what it does to their language, and the way they dress, and all those kinds of things. I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole. I feel like we could talk about <laughs> uh, another day. But yeah, social media has considerably changed. Um, but I, yeah, so I tell people to pick one platform that they're very comfortable on. Make sure you're managing that. Make sure that you're getting reviews on that, um, and just make sure that you're talking to people and that you're that you're responsive and that you're present on those platforms. Because I feel like. You can try to be on all of them, but you'll do all of them poorly, but you could do one really well. So that's kind of so, my advice. Tell me a story here, because I like to not spend time on my business. Okay. I like to just make money. Yeah. Right? You know, and well, have me just, too, but. Have it just show up, right? <laughs> but you know what I mean? So social media to me is painful. Okay. I don't like it. I don't, I mean, I don't like posting or coming up with posts and stuff then like that. Then you don't, that. I mean, you don't have to be on it. I mean, it's, it's the people who are like, if they're retail or they're service based and they want that feedback, they want the relationship and they feel like that platform is going to help close that gap or make that stronger, then yes, I would say spend the time. But you might be like, you know what, Facebook is just, we've tried it, tested it, it's not working for our business and we don't want to use it. You don't need anybody's permission to not use it. I mean, Oh, you, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I people love it when I tell them they only have to be on one platform. They're like, wow, that's great. I didn't know that. It's like I need, they needed permission from a professional to say you don't need to, you don't need to be on them all. But if, I mean, it all comes down to your goals. What are you trying to do with your business? You're like you're, be, might be beyond the point where you don't need awareness anymore. You just need um, to get people to rebuy if they're current customers. And that way, I would recommend you try different marketing tactics for, for those kinds of things. So you know, it's just, a, it, it's about your goals and what you're trying to do with your business at the time that you come on board and either hire my firm or work with a marketing consult. Right. So we, I've worked with a few marketing people because I'm like, social media, do this for me. Yeah. And I remember one of them, uh, they were coming up with a lot of posts. Yeah. It was pretty cheap, but there it was garbage. Yeah, I call that canned content. So, 
a lot of times they'll hire these outside companies and they'll do a great job interviewing you and they'll do a great job um, asking you questions about your target audience, learning about your products and services, but they'll put out content that just is not engaging. It's not spur of the moment. People know that it's canned and kind of preloaded. And so what happens is people stop engaging with that content and then Facebook says, well, nobody likes you anymore. We're not going to show it to your fans. And, and that's literally what happens. And so if you don't get engagement in your content, you will start to stop showing up for even the fans that are on your page. Mm. So my rule of thumb on and my advice on social media is that it's best on boots on the ground. Somebody in the company that is that that's their day to day that can do the behind the scenes videos that can do the unboxing videos. Facebook is that it's faces. They want to see faces. And even at tingles like <clears throat> I put stuff up for our Halloween spirit week and I can already see like it's the most engaging post I've had probably in the last couple weeks because wow. people want to see faces. They want to see people doing things and they want to you know feel that kind of human to human thing so i would just be careful to hire these companies to do this content without being part of that conversation like oh hey we had this 20 year anniversary and here's photos from our party put that up as well because when you hire those outside companies it can be um it, it can be just it, you know it can be like evergreen content about your business the other thing that i find is that people forget to remember is that um people are joining your Facebook page all the time. And so if you're not constantly telling people who you are, what you do, how you're unique, you're kind of missing the mark there because all that content gets pushed down. You know, when you first start building your page, you have your mission statement and your logo and your themes of content. But then, you know, you forget that 18 people joined last month and those people haven't seen those messages. So repeating your content on a regular basis, you know, your story, your why, those things can become really important to do on social on social media. Are there rules? I don't, or I imagine there's gray area to a lot of this, but you have a post, it took you some time, you had to take the photos or video or whatever and mm -hmm. refine it, edit it, all this jazz. And to me, it seemed like that's an awful lot of work for something that may never get seen by anyone but me, or the yeah. person I'm paying to edit that. Yeah. So can you repost posts that you've done before? Or the the social media gods get pissed at that. No, I don't. It's a good question. I don't. I don't think you can on Instagram. I know you can pay, on Facebook. You can repost things, um, and then add your thoughts to them, so you can repost a post. I know you can do that in events and stuff, but right. um, you I don't see know this that. Post. No one else has. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if you want people to see the post, you've got to put money behind it now. Like you have to boost. Is that the it. game? You have to boost, or you boosting is sort of like. I don't know. I used to say that boosting was the like the dollar bin at Target. You don't need any of that stuff, but it's like the low hanging fruit that Facebook's like you should boost this to reach another one point two thousand people. Do it, but spend maybe ten bucks on it. You know, I wouldn't spend you know a thousand dollars on it, but um, if it's something really specific that you're trying to re-engage your current fans on, you could boost it and you know see if that works. But regardless of what you do, you should be looking at the insights of Facebook or the analytics of Instagram or whatever to make sure that whatever you're doing that has a dollar amount behind it is actually going somewhere and doing something. And insights will tell you okay, looking at your last post for the entire month, this video got the most hits, it got the most comments, it got the most shares. So if you're not uh, reviewing those insights on a regular basis, it's sort of like throwing money out the window and hoping you know, that something lands somewhere. So just like anything digital, there's a footprint and there's people, you know, there's content that you can review um, to make sure that those posts are actually going somewhere. And you may find that your videos of behind the scenes and I mean it's funny we just moved into a new space and we painted a mural in my office behind me the videos and the time lapse videos that we did on that mural was the most engagement I've had in months on my page and it was just again like I don't know maybe it says something about the people who are following my Instagram and my Facebook maybe they're designers and not my client you know so I don't really know exactly why we'd be getting such traction on something that has nothing to do with graphic design. I mean, I guess it does. It was it was illustrated by uh, my designer, Callie, but we hand painted it. So and it's not a service offering that we do with other clients. It was sort of out of the norm of what Tingles does. But I'd have never known unless I looked at the insights, how many views that got and you know, that people commented on it. It was a lot of family members that commented on a oh, great nice. painting job. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's. But, but my goals on Facebook are to show the culture and show what it's like to work at Tingles and how fun it is and things like that. I do not think of it as a sales tool at all. So, gotcha. so you're so, moving yourself away from 
a commodity. Right, right. So okay. making tingles more humanized and, mm -hmm. you know, why why would you want to work with us? Because we're fun and because we don't take ourselves seriously and, you know, stuff like that. So that's my goal for that platform. All right. LinkedIn, different goal, different Tell me story about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is going to be more about the companies that we're working with and the problems that we're solving for them. So. ABC company comes to Tingles and their website wasn't mobile friendly. We were able to work with them to get a phenomenal website that, you know, works on tablets and mobile devices. Here's a picture of that, you know, website. So showing people solutions of, of you know, we can put that on Facebook too, that's fine. But the goal of LinkedIn is to get people to see that Tingles is solving problems for small business and we're doing it in a way that is beautiful and designed well. and and that kind of thing. So do you put something in that post that says if you need help or anything like this or it's just assumed yeah. you know who posted it so click on me, you? Yeah I mean my formula for social media that I tell people is to try to ask a question in the post and then end on a call to action of some sort whether it's call now, visit the website, comment below, something like that. Um, a lot of people put stuff out on social media with just statements which doesn't help your algorithm at all for engagement. Oh, interesting. So on LinkedIn, I mean, I have a really good LinkedIn following. Um, I have more people that follow me on Tingles than I'm connected with on LinkedIn. A lot of people ask that. Okay, Tara Ingalls is the owner of Tingles Graphic Design. Do you put content out on Tara's page or do you put it on your business page? I have a lot more businesses following that than I have LinkedIn connections of other people that are following me. And was that a natural or organic thing or did you push that? I didn't push it. We just, when pages became a thing on LinkedIn, I created a page and then started putting content specifically about my work on that page. Because Tara, Tara does lots of other things. Tara's in Rotary, Tara, you know. So I want to put that out on my personal page versus my business page. But sometimes I will share business posts to my personal page. Oh. But that question I get a lot is like, your name is on the door. Why wouldn't you put stuff out on your on your actual, it's just kind of a test and a tinker, right? So you're like testing the same content on both platforms, which or um, both pages, which one's getting more hits? Oh, well, it's getting more hits on this page. I'm going to do more on this page. So you have to just be cognizant of it and like follow it All and see right. how it works and stuff. Because we, I guess, recently, we're talking the past couple months, we mm -hmm. just started a page for this incredible podcast on LinkedIn. Nice. And so you have a follower, you. Nice. Whatever, five. One. Whatever. You gotta start with one. Yeah, so you get that post that you stick all this time, money, and effort, or I pay someone for them to stick time and effort in it and it costs me money. I'm like, that post went to me. Okay, but what's your goal with that page? Like, why did you start it? Because you wanna find guests for the podcast or you want to drive uh, traffic both. to the website? Build an audience. Okay. I guess it, it's twofold, right? You mm -hmm. want cool people as guests, yep. right? Granted today. Okay. And. You want an audience so that when the guest comes on, they're mm -hmm. like, hey, I want to be on this podcast because there's an actual audience that's going to watch it. Okay. So is it okay to have two goals? It's, it's good to have two goals, but you, when you set marketing goals, you need to have, um, you also have to have like numerical numbers behind that. Do you, oh. want, do you want to have uh, five new guests by the end of this quarter? And that will be a satisfactory result of your marketing efforts. Do you oh, want to have 15 more users that become subscribers to the YouTube page, if that's a goal? And then you also need to have a start and an end date. So you're going to start it on December 1st, and by the end of December, you want to see this needle move in this particular social media marketing. If you don't set those kinds of goals, you won't really know what you're trying to, you know, the time, money, and, you know, what you said. Yeah. So, you know, and you have to kind of write that stuff down or, it has to be part of your strategic plan so that you know what content you're supposed to be putting out there and who you're directing that content to in order to get those results. That so, makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So instead of me just throwing stuff at the wall right. or paying somebody to throw stuff at the wall, which is essentially <laughs> what they were doing. Right. I you have them give you goals and say, you know what, based on this trend of content that I'm seeing on your page, I think it's realistic that by, you know, the end of you know, the end of this quarter, I can get you 15 new speakers to line you up for all of next year. Well, then you know that the content is going to be, are you, uh, you know, do you have experience speaking about, do you, or do you have, you know, whatever that messaging is, do mm -hmm. you have experience talking about uh, marketing and you could come on the show and talk about social media marketing for an hour, I'd love to hear from you. You know, that content's gonna be specific to what you want that person to, to do versus you just being like, hey, my podcast is great, go out and watch it. <laughs> 
like that doesn't please that yeah. might help <laughs> for the subscriber goal because you're sure. like you know I'm trying to you know the, the content for that might be I'm trying to get small businesses to listen to experts mm -hmm. give away advice for free you know that are pouring their hearts out and I've learned I have 25 years of experience. I know a lot about this stuff. Giving it for free and don't make the same mistakes that I made. You know, right. listen to this person talk about how to use social media, how to set goals, things like that. So the content's going to be driven on based on what those goals are. And then again, at the end of that, you'll decide, was it successful? Was it not successful? And then you'll tweak it for the next quarter or nice. the next month or whatever you're trying to do. I love it. So yeah. if you're, let's just say, well, let me back up a step. With social media, I always feel like I'm behind the eight ball. So I think, like we did the Instagram thing, we started that, so you start out at zero, mm -hmm. ground level. Mm -hmm. Not on Instagram, it feels like it's been out there 50 years, but it's been out there, I don't know, a handful. Mm -hmm. But everybody seems to have five million followers on yeah. the chats. I'm like, who's watching all this stuff? Yeah. So if you're are you talking about video reels, or are you talking about still imagery on uh, I guess what I'm talking about is, if I'm a small business, right? Let's just say I'm a plumber. I started my first plumbing company. I got my wrench, my toolbox, and my van, and I'm gonna get on Instagram because I know that people that have toilets and sinks are on Instagram. You're shaking your head like no, I shouldn't be on there. No, not be on Instagram. Okay. Because well, who's the target? Probably homeowners. Sure. That uh, you know maybe maybe for a specific service that he does, he does water heater inspections whatever <laughs> i don't know let's see he does it because like it's also based around a service or a product okay. yeah so you know maybe he's got water heaters that he does inspections on so he wants to target older folks that own their home that would be wanting to sign up for these annual inspections as he does or whatever all right instagram is not going to be a good place for him to to do advertising because the the demographic of instagram i think is like Eight, I don't know this for sure, but last time I looked, it was like 18 to 40 year old. Do you want to be targeting oh. someone in like a 40 to, you know, 40 to 65 or okay. maybe a specific demographic of town or whatever? So I guess the whole point of your question is marketing is this ginormous umbrella of services. And I think I said this in our in our last talk is that it's extremely intimidating for somebody to look at how many different offerings you can do to market your business and have any clue which one to do. And so working with a consultant like me or somebody that does marketing, it's their job to say, okay, here's your budget for marketing. This is all you can spend. Okay, we're going to go in this lane and we're going to do this and we're going to see if it works or based on my professional opinion, this is the lane you should be in. Here's what it's going to cost, you know, those kinds of things. I, I think like social media, like for that particular gentleman, like I just did a website for someone who's a plumber. He's very, very comfortable on his phone and he doesn't want to have to manage his website at all. And he'll do videos and upload videos to Facebook and Instagram as reels, but he doesn't do still imagery. Okay. It's all video. So, you know, wow. it's, it's like a behind the scenes of, you know, of him fixing a pipe or how he had to cut into a wall to find the source and how he does those kinds of things. That's going to be a lot more interesting than a still picture of a leak. Yeah. You know? So like there's just, there's, you know, social media is just hard to, hard to talk about. Interesting. <laughs> it, yeah. It's hard to be like. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. All right. Let's shift gears in the websites. Okay. So you have to have a website. Yep. Because there's yellow pages aren't really a thing anymore. Right. So if you want to be found, mm -hmm. it's websites. Yep. Tell me a story about how that game has changed just in getting found yep. and the how people build their websites or it's not just a home about contact us page yeah. kind of, or maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah. So um, website design is definitely being used from a standpoint of credibility and for people trying to find out more about you. It's being, it's very hard to have a website that's tiny, be found. Um, organ what they called organically, which is basically by keywords and content only. And so unless you have a really robust website that has lots of blogs and things like that. So because I work with a lot of small businesses, we do design websites. We still promote website design, but we have to think about how we're going to drive traffic to it. And it's not necessarily just being found by Google alone. So um, digital marketing is becoming a very high priced commodity or, or price that a lot of companies kind of jumped on the bandwagon the last couple of years in trying to help companies get that exposure with pay-per-click, Facebook ads, you know, banner ads, digitally, things like that. But what I'm finding 
Um, and what I wanted to talk about today is a gross misrepresentation that a lot of these companies are not actually doing the services. Oh. They're taking large dollar amounts from very small businesses and providing very little in return. Um, I was on the phone uh, with somebody doing a marketing consult and found out that they're paying a company out of state for uh, about $5,200 a month and they don't know whether that's translating into business for them. Oh. And that's a lot of money for me that's to crazy. swallow and be, and so I'm gonna try to work with them and determine whether or not this reporting is actually generating leads and things like that. In 2023, and this year, I was brought on as a third party consultant to review digital marketing um, services in the Madison area by reputable companies to determine whether or not the services were actually done and whether I could prove that looking at website Google Analytics or traffic alone or forms being filled out, whether or not the services that they were paying for were actually being done. And in most cases, they were not. And it sort of it breaks my heart to know that these small companies are seeing these big promises and then just not, um, not reaping the war rewards out of them. And there's a lot of words like conversion and impressions and all of the thing, all these things that as a small business owner, like some of them I'm even confused by what the difference between, you know, an impression and a conversion is. And um, there's just, a, there's, there's right ways of doing things. And then there are ways of, um, you know, in my test and measuring and in my business, the way that I do things is very different from some of these companies. And I don't, I don't know, like it's, I wrote a blog about it because I, I was actually a victim of service mis misrepresentation. Oh, and, you were? Oh, yeah. Okay. And what happened was I hired an outside company to help with the search engine optimization of my website. I know content-based search engine optimization, but I'm not as strong with things like pay-per-click and some of these other things, and hired this company. Well, the first thing they wanted to do was they wanted to make sure that my current website obviously had keywords in the right place, and so they did this audit. Well, they went in and they changed a whole bunch of my keywords to interior design. Interior design? Interior design. No! Instead okay. of graphic design, they changed images, they changed page titles, they changed content within my website. And my rankings plummeted. And this was like, um, it, it devastated my online presence. Was this a local took, company or this? Mm -hmm. was, oh, this my goodness. Company. And it not only devastated my rankings, but I literally fell off the first page. And I was on the first page for website design. And it was oh gone. Overnight, just gone. It took two years to regain that by going back in, changing all of that. I mean, the drastic change of keywords in my website, Google was like blacklisted and just like, I was on page like nine. I mean, no one was gonna find Tingles. No. The only, the only safe haven was that I had a, a really good Google My Business listing and so I was still showing up in the map area. So if people clicked on that, they'd get to my mm -hmm. website. Um, but yeah, I was devastated. And so, you know, when I went back and said, okay, why these, why did this all happen? It was sort of like, oh, well, sorry about that. You know, <laughs> and, or I couldn't Minor get the, or I got him come, or I was completely ghosted and couldn't get anybody on the line to, to stand up for what had been done. It was horrible. Oh and yeah, so that happened to me. And then to find out basically, you know, that same year, some of my clients were hiring other digital marketing companies to do the same sort of work and finding out that they too were being duped by, you know, paying large dollar amounts. One of my clients almost went bankrupt because they were back charging him after he had canceled wow. for a contract. It's just, it's real bad. So, so I wrote a blog and I would love to share a couple tips yeah, if we have please. time. Please, please, we have so, plenty of time. Yeah, so I wrote a blog and the blog is called um, Tink Tingle's Comprehensive Checklist for Choosing a Trustworthy Digital Marketing Partner. And these are all the things that kind of I wish I would have done and things that I've learned after working with these companies on how to safeguard yourself so that you don't hire a company um, and don't let them talk over you and, and, and those kinds of things. So there's 10 tips in the blog um, and we'll link it in, the in this you got it. video Absolutely. so you can read them all. Um, but the first one is that it kind of comes back to goals, right? So what mm -hmm. are you trying to do with hiring this marketing company? What area of your business do you want to see move forward? Um, and being very specific about your goals. So if it's, if it's you know one service area, um, 
Let's take that plumber, for example. So let's say this plumber has, um, you know, a brand new area of his business where he's doing uh, quarterly hot water heater checks. Don't know if that's a thing, but let's say that that's a product that he wants to start moving forward, right? So he's saying, I would really love for this product to take off. And within the first quarter of 2025, I'd love to have 35 clients because you and your marketing person have decided that that's a good number and you'd like to have that. So you kind of determine that that's the time frame, that's the product that you want and you, you know, so you've written that down and that is what you go to this company to do. So you've defined the goal, um, you've maybe defined at that point which marketing avenue that you want to do. So let's say you're going to do Facebook advertising to maybe get this out in front of some homeowners, whatever. So that's a d defined goal. The second thing is that if you're going to start um, researching digital marketing companies to help you with this is getting a very detailed proposal from them. I'm not saying like you don't want anything that's like a one lump sum, you know, for $2,500 we're going to do this or for $3,500. It needs to be very detailed into what is the, d the, the management cost going to be versus what the actual ad spend is going to be because those are very different things. The ad spend is going to be like their out-of-pocket expenses for running the ad for you and that should be not marked up. It should be the same rate if it's $300 or whatever. That's what you should pay. But then there's usually a management fee on top of that to do the creative for the ad, come up with the copy, that kind of stuff. But the other things that need to be in there is kind of what are the tools that they're going to use to make it rain? Like, are they going to use Facebook, Google? Like, what are they going to use? Um, what is the timeline? What are the costs? Again, like I said, what team members are they are going to be doing the work? And what is going to be the commitment length? So if you're going to start in January by the end of March, or maybe we're going to have a meeting at the end of January, again, all that stuff has to be in that proposal um, for you to have any kind of leg to stand on if it's not going to work in the end. And my recommendation is that you don't send anything more than 30 to 60 days. Um, a lot of these contracts are a year long, and you'll hear from the provider, oh, we need to have it be a year long because it really doesn't kick in until about month six. That's baloney. It should kick in the first week or month you start doing the campaign. Digital advertising is just that it's digital. There's a footprint. You can measure. Uh, you can measure it. So that's my recommendation on kind of that time frame. Get testimonials is kind of my third tip. Is get testimonials from your industry from someone they've worked with within the last 90 days mm. and I think that can go really far and even if it's not in your industry just get a testimony of somebody that they've worked with in the last 30 days it's similar to the plan that you're going to do and phone number email contact them and ask how it went and you know you can um, you can ask them you know how was the communication like what was the reporting can I have an example of a report that you know that you you know that you saw things like that happy clients are going to be more than happy to talk about their experience and their, um, you know, good, good and bad. So, um, you know, that I think that's really important. Um, the fourth is getting examples of the reports. So a lot of digital marketing companies be like, oh, you're going to get this, you know, quarterly reporting, this monthly reporting. And this phone call that I had with, a, you know, uh, earlier today, he was getting Excel reports. <laughs> uh, it's very easy to click on that cell and change that number. I want to see like tangible reports, screenshots from Google Analytics, screenshots from actual form submissions of, you know, I want to see, you know, I want to see the, the funnel page or the landing page that you're going to design that this traffic is going to go to. You know, any of that reporting I think is really important. And, and, and I want to know also, is that going to be in layman's terms or is it going to be using technical jargon? Because what is conversion? What is impression like we talked about? So asking for example reports and making sure that you know who you're going to be talking to if you have change requests or anything like that. And then the fifth thing, of course, the, the fifth, which is the actual, the, the ninth tip is the, you know, the ethical and legal aspect of, of kind of these contracts and, and things that they put together is ask how they're going to benchmark where you are right now and how they are going to show that the work that they've done is successful and not at the end of the campaign, how are you going to like show me other reporting that shows this is where we started and this is where we ended? To show that they're on to target. show that they know what they're doing, that they were actually able to provide the amount of leads that they're promising you, um, because that is the one thing that that I've been told that people who've read this blog 
that is the one thing that they're not getting from these companies up front is they're like, oh no, we, you know, we can't share that because it's proprietary. Black out the name. I don't need to see the name. I just want to see how you've actually digitally helped these people by showing the numbers of, you know, conversions and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. again, there's, you know, there's a lot of different things in here. Um, getting, getting more than one proposal is really important. Um, carefully reviewing contracts and, and any hidden language in there that, you know, might be, you know, you shouldn't have to sign a contract that's four pages long for a month long commitment. You know, it's either you can do the work or you can't. A lot of times, the longer the contract, the more they've been sued or oh. have had problems, <laughs> in my opinion. It's just so, try to protect themselves in 50 yes, different directions. Yes. So, you know, those are my tips when it comes to digital marketing. But um, I think your initial question was, you know, how do you, um, as far as website design is concerned, um, yeah, I do think the websites are still very relevant. I think they're still really important. Um, there's a lot of really great do-it-yourself tools that people mm -hmm. can use um, nowadays uh, to get really good-looking websites and um, make sure they're mobile and stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse Bless me. You. Bless you. Uh, we can't talk about design without talking about AI in this age that we're in. I, I feel like you about AI. <laughs> I feel like it's funny to me because the year 2000, the dot-com bubble, or is that 2001? Mm. Dot-com bubble when pets.com was a thing, and then the world came to an end right there. Yep. I remember all the crazy Super Bowl ads and yep. all this kind of stuff. You could yep. throw a dot-com after anything, yep. and you got your billions of dollars. Maybe back then it was millions. Yeah. Now you can say you got AI, you got your billions. You're raising money hand over fist. Yeah. So tell me a story about how AI gets involved in so all of this. So I saw something that is like resonated with me. It said, AI is not going to take your job. Somebody who knows how to use AI is going to take your job. Oh. And that is, I feel like, a very good summary of where my industry is at when it comes to AI. Um, my designers are very anti-AI, uh, you know, when it comes to certain things like, you know, generating logos or fixing, um, you know, like, here's a photo of five people make it so that it's two people and you know fill out you know things like that so they're not they're not hap they're not ready to jump into using some of those tools that like th that are at their fingertips right now oh, is that because of fear or is that because the result isn't as good as they'd like it's not fear it's mainly because the result isn't as good and it's all it, it's mainly because the result is not as good okay it's got a little cheese factor to it it's got a little cheese factor to it i mean i've seen pretty amazing things with the what's called like generative ai in indesign or in photoshop where let's say you've got a picture of like two birds sitting on a ledge and you need it to be, uh, and it's a square image, and you need it to be a panoramic image where you're like, take the text box or the box and you out and you're like, fill in the rest, and it'll like fill in more branches from the tree and maybe put a park in the background. Like you can tell it what you want it to do. So that's really interesting. I, I haven't done enough research to know like, eventually at this point, we're gonna, you're gonna have to divulge, I think, that the, the photo was created in AI or that it was edited or something along those lines. I don't know that we're there yet. I think that AI is going to get very good at knowing what is a real photo and what is not a real photo, either through some sort of weird coding within the file. It's, I don't know, like that part of it, but we're using AI to help our clients be more succinct in their marketing. A lot of my clients are using AI to help them generate blog ideas, um, to take content that they've written and optimize it for keywords, for search engine optimization. Um, they're using it to write social media posts. I mean, you as long as you write a prompt that is very well written in 4.0, ChatPG 4.0, you can generate tons of, of content, that evergreen content that we're talking about. The problem with it is it's just vanilla. It's all vanilla, and if you don't add some sprinkles or something to it, it's just going to be vanilla. So, you know, it's good for generating lots of content ideas, but then ultimately you really do have to take those and you have to, like, personalize them and, and put imagery to them and That's fair. hashtags it's a starting and things point. like It's a good starting point. That's it's what I feel like. It's easier to fix than it is to create yeah. a lot of times. Because I have a hard time writing content from scratch. Like my daughter is, is um, uh, applying to colleges right now and um, she's only 12. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, she's applying to colleges just to write essays, right? And of course, like, you know, it's easy just to go out to chat GPT and be like, write an essay that's going to make me sound amazing to go to UW. I want to be a badger. Um, but it, there's no way that you wouldn't read 
an article written by Chad and not know that it's written by Chad. There's mm. no stories in there. There's no personal. There's no personality in that copy or whatever. And I was the first to say to her, like, I'm not the right person to help you write this essay. I'm oh. not a good writer. Like, <laughs> I am a very wordy person. And so, like, I struggled, like, as her mom being like, I'm not good at this. And I think it was hard for me to be like, I'm not good at this. So we hired a career um, a essay coach that oh, wow. worked with her one on one and helped her with her essay and it ended up being perfect and it sounds like her and it's her personality and did they use chat? No, they didn't, you know, so, but, you know, I mean, I can imagine that that is an easy tool for people to pick up and manipulate yeah. um, and, and use, but I've gone to prompt writing seminars that teach you how to write prompts in such a way that gives you the output that you're looking for because otherwise it's super vanilla like we're talking about. And so I think um, if you go to those and you learn how to use the tools, I mean, there's so many AI tools out there for so many different things. You can go, I think somebody told me, you can go out to an AI tool and you can, it'll build an entire website for you on that AI platform. I have no idea if this is true. But go out, it'll write all the copy. Like, I'm a plumber located in Madison, Wisconsin. Go out and build me a website. This is my business name. And it will build you a website completely AI-based. Wow. And I'm just like, yeah, is that a little scary for me as a website designer? Yeah. Yes and no, but when that website comes back and there's no keywords in it and, you know, it's using stock imagery of, of a plumber that's not an, a real person or, you know, whatever, it's just, I don't know. I'm not too worried about it in my career. Everyone is asking me those questions, but I think like good design is it, there's still going to be a place for really good illustration and hand drawn. I think I think it's going to the AI is going to be the the opposite is going to happen is where people are going to go back to paper and pencil and the there's going to oh. be more of I don't know. I'm to the point of wax. I <laughs> or the, the wood carvings? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. No, I don't. I just think that people are going to value something that is, is created by your hands more than they're going to value something created by a computer. All right. I don't know. I created a, an AI graphic out on my Facebook page because we're celebrating our um, 25th in January, like I mentioned, and we're going to be rebranding Tingles. And everyone's like, I want to see the logo. And I'm like, nope, we're not going to show it. So I went out to AI and I said, generate an image of two witches standing in front of a cauldron with steam coming out of the cauldron, but I don't want to see the witches' faces. And there's an image out on our Facebook right now that was generated by AI that was not illustrated by us. And their like fingers are all like weird oh, yeah. and like <laughs> their face is not right and stuff. And I'm just like, you know, this is what AI generated. This is the prompt that I put in. Um, and we captioned it, something is brewing at Tingles, just to kind of give it some idea what we were nice. doing with it. But, you know. It, to me, if I would have sent that to my designers and been like, hey, spend six hours illustrating this or 10 hours illustrating this, you know, is that the best use of their time when it comes to social media posts that I wanted to do? So I just, I don't know, I think we're going to go back to a medium where people are just not going to, they're not going to, I mean, I don't know, some of it's really scary. A little bit's a little bit scary. Um, Fair. Just the AI with identity theft and bank information and all that kind of stuff. I think we're going to go back to paper ledgers and like, <laughs> you know, checks, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Don't, Picture don't, Scrooge. He's got the I don't know. Character. Something. It's weird. But yeah, I don't know. I'm in, in my lifetime of my business, I don't think it will be problematic. But, all right. But I do like the quote about, you know, somebody who knows how to manipulate the AI software will be the one who takes the job. Not That's fair. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so afraid uh, to a point because of call answering service, and that seems to be... Sure. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily low-hanging fruit, but I feel like a lot of AI places are treating it like low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. It's like, we can replace the receptionist or secretary by having AI answer the phone. And I'm like, I don't know how many times I've had that artificial me. voice, and you're just like, human, person, someone with a pulse and a brain. Yeah, someone customer service, customer just service. Like, I did not understand prompt. Yeah. yeah. Press like nine you, for customer a, a service. A programmer built you somebody in a hoodie and Crocs that hasn't ever had to deal with this. <laughs> I need someone that can eat a sandwich <laughs> and not look gross to answer my question. Eat <laughs> sandwich, yep. Yeah, I don't know. That whole, the, the robo-bots things where, um, that is one thing. Uh, please don't put that on your website. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, all these chat bots that are like, I'm an automated chat bot to answer your question about I this did, company. I did. Uh -uh. I, so that is not going to give you business, Lee. Interesting. Unless you were behind that chat. So what we did 
was we were essentially, or what we do, is we essentially show that we can build these for clients. Oh. Because we can. Mm -hmm. And it's not... With uh, like frequently asked questions about the company, correct, those kinds of correct. things? Okay. These are like open-ended bots that are like, no. ask me anything. No, 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 no. You know, it's just No, like this is stuff where you, you're inputting essentially, or the bot is using your website as information that's pulling from. Got it. So it's okay. not pulling from the entire web. Okay. It's pulling from your information, stuff that you feed it. But so like, okay, let's say for example, somebody wants to know what your pricing is. They just want to know what your pricing is and that's not on your website. How does um, it handle those questions? It would either direct you to a pricing page or it'll ask you for an email address and say someone will follow up with Got you. it, okay. Yeah, it's not Jesus or no. some like, I have all the answers, right? <laughs> or something like that. It's like, yeah. what are your open hours? But, but you prompting it with information is very different than it like AI going out to the World Wide Web and saying, okay, here's what you should pay for a logo design. Or no, here's what you right. should pay for, you know. <laughs> yeah, it should be don't, 50 cents. Yeah, 55, you know, yeah. Or go to these websites that are cheaper than this website. I mean, you just, that's what would terrify me. It's just like it would go rogue and be like, Tingles is right. not the company for you. I don't know, like, I don't so know. So tell me a story, because the design thing is curious to me. Okay. Because I think I've put stuff out there, right? You got books and all that jazz. Yeah. And someone could say, like, I was playing around with this kid. We're at my son's baseball game. Okay. And she's a big Taylor Swift fan. Okay. And so I'm like, I'm going to write lyrics for a Taylor Swift song, right? She's like seven years old, so it's just kind of fun teasing her. Yeah. And then somebody suggested that I use Chat GPT to write a Taylor Swift song. And I was like, all right. Okay. And so we wrote a Taylor, or we, I typed in prompts for Chat GPT to write a Taylor Swift song. Mm -hmm. And we said, um, it was about jets and hot dogs and baseball, just Not weird stuff. Good. Just throwing curveball after curveball. Okay. And it pumped out stuff, and I was like, okay. It pumped out stuff, which was actually kind of funny. It wasn't bad, yeah. as Taylor Swift songs go. Yeah. Not, not too deep. Anyways, um, hey. From my, no, I'm just, <laughs> I have no problem with Taylor Swift. <laughs> right? I'm just saying, like, most songs, they're really kidding. not that deep, right? Yeah. Anyways, you got to do whatever you got to do in, yeah. in things that rhyme. So for anyways, entertainment, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I'm like, this bot or this little AI prog program had to go somewhere to get if thens, mm -hmm. and it probably had to go to Taylor Swift songs. Yeah, probably read Somebody prior wrote, lyrics. I don't know, maybe Taylor, the Sw Taylor Swift wrote her own songs? I don't yeah. know. Okay, so Taylor Swift right. wrote these songs, or whoever did, or writer yeah. did, whatever. Yeah. Somebody wrote those songs right. that this program then used to come up with other lyrics, yeah. and that initial person or people aren't being compensated in any way. Yeah, that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how's that going to work out when someone's like, create me a logo? Great. It's not creating a logo from scratch. No. It's creating it by looking at a bunch of other logos that were yep. designed by other people yep. that aren't being compensated. Yeah. So that's, that, is, that is something where somebody provided me with a logo that was AI generated and I took the iconic, so the, there was the icon on the top and then the text underneath. I took the icon and took, it up, took the text off and just took the icon and did a reverse Google image lookup and there were four other companies that had the same icon. Oh, nice. So you do have to be really careful and even websites like Fiverr or you know, these companies where they crowdsource logo design, they're just taking the same logo icon and putting your business name on the bottom of it. Like they don't care at all that they did that to the other four plumbers that they had given logos for. So you just have to be careful to do that if you're gonna crowdsource your branding. Um, it's just, can, it can really nip you if, um, you know, if even if you design it similarly to something that came up on AI. I mean, at Tingles, our logo design process starts with paper and we're literally sketching on paper mm -hmm. to try to, and of course, like your subconscious is gonna come up with things that maybe you saw somewhere, but if a client gets down to like two or three logos and they're like, oh, I can't decide or I can't decide between, we're gonna run them all through Google Lookup just to make sure that they don't accidentally look like something else before we finalize that logo. Because it's just, it's inevitable that your brain stores pictures of, you know, and it, it might be a pizza place and a massage parlor that you you know that you saw the pizza place place logo and they were like I really want a pizza in my massage parlor logo or whatever massage logo and you just think about it or you know so I think it's important to just because there the internet has that ability for you to do that but AI is pulling from all those Google images all of those icons all of those different things even if you prompt it to say not to do that 
it has it's to. coming from somewhere. Yeah, or it's drawing it from somewhere. Right, yeah. create this out of nothing. Like, yeah, I, I mean, it is like. it is magic. I don't. I don't you raised know. an interesting point where we are essentially doing the same thing. To do what? So when we're when we're writing or creating a logo or something like mm -hmm. that, we're working from memories that we have or right. experiences. So right. Right. That boo, that just got murkier, and it's yeah. already a mess. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, everybody has pre they, Everyone's raised differently. Everyone sees different things. So, I mean, that's one of the things I love most about having multiple designers on my team because so many people come with different backgrounds and different, um, not only just illustration backgrounds, but some of them are photographers. Some of them are pottery. They do pottery. Some of them are painters, you know, and having these different disciplines in the creative fields, like just makes them a better graphic designer Nice. Um, from that standpoint. We, we have a book in our office that one of our designers just got for a birthday gift. It's a menu design from like the 1800s in Europe. Wow. And it is the That's coolest. Specific? Yeah, it's <laughs> the coolest book. It's like this big. And it's like all of these were hand painted menus from Europe. And it's just like a really neat thing to look at to be inspired by you know and it's like who would think to look at that but there's like illustrations in there and you know hand typography and hand lettering which we're really into at tingles right now and so some waiter waitress had a copy of those and they're yep. like we're out of soup yeah <laughs> <laughs> Just put some spaghetti sauce yeah, on that. Or something. Yeah, I mean the way that that was done back then. I mean everything was hand done, and it was, I don't know. We just we just at tingles like this, just kind of in our blood to, to like do things by hand and have like this very organic nature to it. That's why our designs look very different from each other. Oh, I get that. I yeah. get that. When I, I went to school for graphic design, I know. I was always right. you always start out mm -hmm. with. I think I was taught to do a grid of fifty. And you had to come up with 50 rough logo ideas. Oh my gosh, and that then sounds like a lot of pressure. We don't come up with that many. Uh, it w yeah, it was. We made but 50 it wasn't like refined. They yeah. just ballpark. Yeah, ball like like concepts, like yeah. ideas. Yeah, it was like, like take 20 digital. seconds on each one kind yes. of thing. Yes, yes. And some you just like smiley face, fill in the square kind of thing. And <laughs> others you're like, I like what I did there. And yeah. It was it was yeah. a brainstorming thing. Yeah, to brainstorming. Get your mind yep. flowing. That's why we that's why we sit down and do that first, away from technology, away from distractions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is, we've always done it that way, and it's you know sometimes when we have lots of designers, it's it's just like crazy how some designers will come up with the exact same concept. Oh, you know, that I mean that's rare, but it's like you know we'll look at them and we're like oh my god I have the same concept, so we know that that might be a good concept if multiple designers come okay. up with it. Um, you had Lionel Richie playing in the background, and they yeah, came up we, with we the like dancing on the ceiling logo music. or something. <laughs> hey, we always have some music. Yeah. All right. No. Yeah. Nice. So, how do you find a good designer for as an employee? So we have an internship program at Tingles. That's a hands-on, three-month um, uh, program. They come in for about twenty hours a week. Um, and we try to pair them with a nonprofit or a startup so that during the course of these three months, they can do a logo, sales collateral, website, social media setup, whatever it is that that company needs, so that they can then take that full suite and put in their portfolio, either for graduation, oh, they have nice. to be in their last semester, or they have to be recently graduated. But it's an opportunity then for them to get a full suite of for a company that usually is picked by me to be like, something that's deficient in their portfolio, something that they don't already have, something that's different, something that will challenge them. And then they also get to do printer tours and all cl Tingle's client work and they get to be part of our team and things like that. So that's, and most of those designers lately have been coming from Madison College. They have a phenomenal design program there. Really? Mm -hmm. Both of my designers that I have right now are both from Madison College. Oh, that's cool. Um, beautiful hands-on program. They bring in clients to do uh, real world work. They're very like, um, they're they're very uh, grounded in that they have faster turnaround than most of the other schools. Like someone like I have a I have a whole semester to do a logo. No, you have five hours at Tingles to do yeah. a logo. <laughs> so they're more like grounded in that they understand like turnaround and expectations and stuff like that. So yeah, so our, we don't have an intern right now. We usually don't during the holidays, but we'll be accepting applications for January, February, March internship in December. Yeah, that's that where they so come cool. from. It's so cool you mentioned the. Portfolio thing because yeah. I remember trying to get a job as a graphic paper designer. portfolio. Holy, now oh everyone my has gosh. websites. Yeah, I think I just recently tossed it, but I remember looking at it. I don't know within the past couple of years. Mine got damaged. It was it got our storage room got flooded and all of my original designs oh no. got damaged. And you know, of course, I was like, ah! like my baby. <laughs> right. And then I was like, crap, crap, it's yeah, all crap. I, I mean, so it was all bad, but. 
you know, I brought it. We did a portfolio day where everybody in the in my company brought their portfolio in, and we all just kind of looked at each other's original schoolwork. <laughs> it was like really, you're fired. Get and out. I was like, no, I was like, <laughs> please don't look at mine. And they're like, we want to see where Tingle started. And I'm like, okay. So you know, you're looking at this, and I'm like, how did I get this business off the ground? Uh. This crappy went. No, it was it was fine work. It just was not. I was not. I did not have the training. I'm self taught, so I yeah. didn't have the training that my designers have with. Illustrator and all this kind of other stuff. So, you know, it just wasn't as polished. But I'll tell you, and they will probably laugh if they hear this, I can always tell if it's not centered. Oh, Something's not centered. Nice. So, because it's just the eye that I had working at WPS before I started Tingles, where it was just like all I did was forums, forums and brochures and print. And um, But I have an eye for if, th if things are centered or not. They got a it's pixel kinda, off, and you're like, maybe not a pixel, but I can tell. That. And they'll always <laughs> just be like, Make sure it's on there, Kelly. Like, <laughs> I can awesome. tell. I can tell. I that know, is it's, awesome. It's, it's that I after 25 years. That's so, good. Yeah, it's a great program. It's the program that I was looking for after I graduated college um, that could never find. Um, but All yeah, right. it's really fun. It's pretty it, It's pretty competitive. Um, the but, jobs are? It's competitive to get into this program. Like, okay. I'll get probably five, ten applications from graduating oh, wow. class to do okay. internship because it's paid too right. and that's really rare to find a paid internship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our current intern that was in our prior is finishing her degree and then we're probably going to bring her back um, for a little bit longer because um, she just couldn't do it all and go to school and be in the internship at the same time. So. Tell me about personality of employees because I imagine that's a big deal yeah. especially for something like this. Yeah, the smaller, so my team's very small right now and to bring on anybody is a risk, you know, from a culture. We have a very good relationship with the three of us that we have right now, and we're looking for somebody that's super lighthearted, that is doesn't take themselves seriously, that's, you know, willing to grow in this profession and take constructive criticism and um, do some grunt work. You know, I mean, everybody in our office does grunt work. We don't just say, hey, you're the designer, you're the intern, go make like, coffee. Like, okay, you're not saying digging ditches or anything. No, <laughs> no. I mean, they come in and they're like, the thing I hear the most in our internship was, holy crap, I did not expect to be doing that much work. Like, I come in and. Design work. Yeah, like, I just throw them to the wolves. Like, if you don't, if you can't come yeah, in and you can't. You're not paying them to heat a seat, though. No, right. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, like I didn't expect. And so they have to be very organized. They don't have to prioritize their design work. They know, you know, work in a team setting, but also be very self-motivated, I need. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm quirky. I'm, you know, I am. <laughs> I had bunny ears on before I came in today because it's Halloween you Spirit Week. Them on. I know, it's Halloween Spirit Week at Tingle. So today's pun day and I was, uh, don't worry was on my shirt and then I had ears don't worry be hoppy so you know and then we have like desk decorating competitions in December oh, and nice. you know we're in a new space now so I don't know what that's going to look like during the holidays now but yeah we go for walks and I bring in treats and I just I'm I'm like a different I'm a different kind of boss so you you if you're looking for a lot of structure don't want to come work for tingles so is it challenging to be kind of the cool boss as well as introduce discipline when it's necessary? I mean, one of my designers has been with me for 11 years, the other one for six. That's, wow. you know, okay. those two design, they're very loyal to the, they're very excited about this rebrand that we're doing. They work really well together. Um, they want to work. I mean, I don't do, um, I don't do uh, reviews with my staff okay. ever. I hate it and mm -hmm. it's awful. And when I did it at WPS, I would leave crying and I think I have PTSD <laughs> from that. And so I just don't do them. The HR meeting with the Kleenex box. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I would cry every time. And I'd be like, really? I got a five cent raise? That's what? And so it, I just give raises when I want to give raises and I give bonuses when I want to give bonuses. I give PTO when I want to give PTO. So it's just, it's a very different kind of managing. And I've had people leave because I'm not, the manager that they need oh. and that's fine with me okay. you know I had, I had somebody leave during COVID because I was more concerned about people's well-being than I was about getting business done like huh. I wasn't that's like how many hours did you build today I was like how are you doing like is your son driving you crazy because he's you know middle schooler and running around the house and she was just like you know she just said that she was more concerned about you know, uh, that I was more concerned about that. And then, like, I was really taken aback by that. And I'm like, crap, maybe I should be. Like, no. Like, right. if I want this team to survive through this and we don't know what's going to happen in the end, why in the world would I care more about productivity than... And honestly, we were more productive in COVID because of that, I think. Because I 
gave them time off to process things or work at night because they had to homeschool or whatever it was. And it was just sort of like, bye bye. Like I really didn't care about that uh, client or that employee leaving and she just wasn't the right fit for yeah. our culture at Sounds all. Sounds like it, it's your so, business, you get to choose the yeah, culture. Yeah, I do get to choose and I... Or try to define it anyways. Yeah, and employees. I don't want people shooting on me because like I'll run my business however I want mm -hmm. and the minute that people start saying you should be this by now or you should be running this or you know whatever, if my employees want something, they're going to come to me for it um, and ask or they should know they can if you know Fair. If they don't already. Fair. I like that. Yeah. Tara, thank you so much for being on the show. You're welcome. Where can people find you? Uh, Tingles.com, T-I-N-G-A-L-L-S.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, we have a YouTube channel, but right. it's not nearly as great as his. All right. <laughs> Go to Tingles.com. The bar's pretty low. So I don't know. I really love it. We're cool. We're yeah. cool. I appreciate yeah. that. You make it easy. I try. I got awesome guests. That makes it even easier. Right? Yeah. I can't believe I'm third time. Three times. Uh, this has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We're locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. Calls on call, offering call answering and reception of services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book of the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Tara Ingalls. Website one more time. Tingles.com. Easy enough. <laughs> Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night at the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business. <laughs>